timely, but not not too late in the in the in the, uh, in the month. So now here we have our speaker, um, Dr. Gregory Tricky, and uh, he is from the University of Calgary in Canada. So um, he will be, as you can see, talking about uh, EAP and ESP uh, writing. So particularly focusing on uh, cultural impact. So in fact, uh, this is really his uh, area of uh, interest and research uh, in applied linguistics, particularly focusing on uh, English language as communicative vehicle in international professional context for people of different first language backgrounds. So, uh, and I know that recently he has been focusing on looking at nursing, right, this particular area. So for those who are interested in nursing, which is not particularly uh, the focus of this talk, but you can ask him questions also in relation to that the number of projects in relation to nursing this particular discipline. So, and, and Greg just said you could interrupt him at any point uh, during his talk. So uh, feel free to ask him any questions and comments. So let's welcome Greg. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, uh, my name, you can call me by my short form name, Greg. Uh, I'm Associate Professor at Workman School of Education at the University of Calgary in Canada. About uh, 150 years ago, I lived in Hong Kong. Uh, 100 years ago, I, I spent a long time in Singapore and Malaysia, which is where kind of the bulk of my um, interest in um, EAP came about, and then the focus of my research shifted to the Middle East and Central Asia. So uh, I uh, ended up in uh, Canada. I'm originally Australian. My uh, father is Australian, my mother Canadian, but spent most of my school, my you know, primary and secondary school in Canada. So my accent is very Canadian. Uh, Canada is an officially officially bilingual country, and it has multiculturalism as na a, a national policy. So Canada is a, like Hong Kong, a favored immigration destination. So in 2017, about 22 percent of Canadians were new immigrants, two years or less. Uh, so, uh, it's very much a multilingual, multicultural environment, and our government is especially keen to reap the benefits of international students. So, uh, our classes at university are full of people from uh, language backgrounds other than English. So, EAP and ESP are very important components in our university program. So we have a, a live laboratory, which forms the basis of the study I'm going to be talking about. As Dr. Wong said, um, I am happy to be interrupted at any time. I want to make this relevant to you, so if you feel that I, I, I don't just want to just uh, unload my slides on you, I want to have a talk that's relevant to you, I can, uh, interact on many facets of post-secondary English language teaching, language proficiency testing, and so on. So I don't want to be limited to that. I'm a laid-back Canadian-Australian, so you can interrupt at any time and take it in a different direction. If you want to view the slides, you should be able to download them at that uh, website. Here. Alright, so culture and second language learning. Uh, perhaps because culture and language are so closely intertwined, uh, the study has a study of culture has formed an important part of research into language teaching. There are some elements of language learning that are very difficult to understand without at least some reference to culture. 
Uh, yet, it is very difficult for scholars to agree on a clear definition of what constitutes culture. Everyone knows what the word culture refers to, but when you go to define it precisely, it's very difficult to do. And all kinds of objections appear whenever you try to define culture. So a little bit of background. Uh, I'll be very short on the, the literature review part, but. Robert Kaplan is typically associated with kicking off the discussion of culture when it comes to second language uh, learning and kicking off the field of contrastive rhetoric. Kaplan theorized that there are cultural thought patterns that underpin language and so that when you apply those thought patterns to the task of second language writing, no matter what uh, language you're writing in, it impacts Kaplan view, a thought, the way that uh, the way that you structure a text. So if my first language is Arabic, for example, uh, I'm writing in another language, I will use Arabic thought patterns to structure my text. Uh, quite logical. And this approach uh, of contrastive rhetoric uh, has been central to uh, studying second language writing when it comes to culture. It's also uh, central to the more trendily named reincarnation of contrastive rhetoric called intercultural rhetoric. If you do a literature search around the effect of culture on L2 writing, CR and IR, as I'll call them, will pop up right away, figure very centrally in studies of culture and second language writing. However, these approaches are not without their criticisms. For one thing, there is a tendency to overgeneralize. Uh, if your first language is Japanese, uh, the CR perspective will tend to lump you together with all Japanese speakers and say when Japanese writers write in English, they write thus and so. Uh, critics have pointed out rightly that it's a leap of faith to say that everyone from every language group writes exactly the same way. That's a big jump. Uh, another criticism is the dichotomous nature of contrastive rhetoric. As the word contrastive implies, it's always looking for contrasts. So critics have pointed out that uh, that, that tendency to always find difference may blind researchers to similarities. Maybe there are things uh, that uh, L1 and L2 have in common, but contrastive rhetoric, rhetoric by definition is always looking for contrasts. So some very valid criticism. And then we have the old problem of finding a clear definition of culture. So critics of contrastive rhetoric have said, hey, if your central thesis is that culture is the, the biggest impact upon writing, you need to clearly define culture. But generally, uh, uh, people who are adherents of CR and, and IR cannot agree on what constitutes culture. So this uh, poses a big problem. And there's also a, a, method, a methodological criticism of contrastive rhetoric. That is, it draws heavily upon texts, uh, written text, as the source of data. So that's not the only kind of communication that happens. So that over-dependence on uh, textual sources is a key element of uh, the methodol methodological side of criticism for CR. 
there must be other data sources out there. So our research team took it upon ourselves to take on board these criticisms. And we received a grant to study uh, the, it, what uh, our students felt was the impact of culture on their second, second uh, language writing. But we tried to, as I said, take on board these criticisms of contrastive rhetoric. And so uh, what follows is a report on our study. These are the, the starting point. So we did not define culture for our research participants. We wanted to avoid the top-down approach of saying culture means this, how does it affect your writing? We wanted the definition of culture to come from the participants themselves. Uh, Atkinson and Song call this a bottom-up approach. Culture defined by those experiencing it, not by the researchers. Uh, we let the learners define what culture meant to them, and then ask them how they thought culture, however defined, impacted upon their writing in EAP and ESP uh, context. We also asked students their perception of how EAP and ESP writing instructors could help them with respect to culture. Again, uh, by their definition, whatever they meant by it. This picture is of Lake Louise in, uh, in the Rocky Mountains near where my university is. If you, uh, if you visit our university, uh, I'd be happy to take, we give a standard tour right there. <laughs> uh, you'd be more than welcome. So I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and think about your own context. Discuss with the person beside you. If writers in your context were asked about the impact of culture on their writing, what do you think they would say? Take two to three minutes to talk to someone beside you and then we'll hear from you. <laughs> Thank you. 
And you mean this picture here? Uh, yeah. So that's a task you would do with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And when they were, if they were doing that task, how would they say culture impacts their answers? Mm. I'm not sure. Okay. Who would you like to hear from? Can you pick up some? <laughs> <laughs> I I once attend. Teachers, yeah. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Karen. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, we had a conversation and a couple of issues came up. It's, um, basically, I mentioned that if a student were to study outside of their own country, if they were a Chinese student studying outside of China, for instance, they may be more aware of culture and the impact of how culture would affect their language acquisition skills than someone who would be in the country. It's the fish describing water syndrome. <laughs> Something like that, yes. Uh, we also say that uh, they might be more aware of the differences in writing patterns than they would be of similarities, something that we found out earlier. Um, what's the impact of culture? Do we get around that at all? Uh, the way you think would affect uh, the way you express your ideas. Is the way we think cultural? Yes. Yes, we think so. Who would you like to hear from? Give one more. Hmm. Someone. Um, Lorenda. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lorenda. We, we, yeah, hi, hi. Lorenda. Uh, we were talking about it from a teacher's perspective, really, not from an out to writer's yeah. perspective, but we were saying that in our teaching we notice certain genres, for example, are tackled differently, but then we were wondering if that was the impact of the educational system rather than the culture, because Hong Kong students respond to different genres differently depending on what educational system they are into as well. Their familiarity with certain things. Does maybe, maybe the culture influences the, edu the educational system. Does the culture influence the educational system, or the educational system impacts upon the culture? Both, to some extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. to teach culture. Culture. I would love to hear from everyone. I, I would love to. So again, feel free to interrupt. So here's what our students said. 
Uh, we drew our data from two sources, semi-structured interviews uh, with L2 writers in a post-secondary academic writing program. There were 19 different nationalities with 11 different first languages. Uh, so we were very pleased with the, the diverse representation in our study sample. I'm involved with uh, a, a school now in, in my city in Canada where 60% uh, of students, over 60% are uh, classified as English language learners. So uh, two thirds of the students in a, in a secondary school. Uh, so uh, these were our participants. And in semi-structured interviews, the researcher comes with a series of prepared questions, but also has the latitude to pursue different lines uh, based on different lines of inquiry based on the students' response, the participants' responses. Uh, so here is a sample of the prepared questions that guided the interviews, uh, but in many cases, these were launch pads to something else. So these were the uh, three questions. What's your understanding of culture? What cultural factors do you think affect your English academic writing? And can you explain with an example of these cultural factors? And again, uh, if you want to see the slides, if you want to have the slides, I'll show you the, the link at the end again. Then uh, we also gathered data from uh, some uh, written prompts. So we asked students to participate in an interview and a, to do a reflective writing piece. Uh, many of the students did both, some did one or the other, there's a, there's a mix. But these were, the, these were the prompts that students were given. When I say students, I should say this is a, 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 an ethics, institutional ethics approved research study. So students were not required to, this was not part of the course, they, they volunteered to be part of the study. The class, what language? The, the prompts were in, were the All students, English. So the students weren't allowed to use their own language. I wouldn't say they were not allowed, but the questions were asked in English. At times, we had a, a some of them, we had a, a, a researcher with the same L1 as the students. So sometimes they would kind of code switch, but there were 19 or 11 different languages, so we didn't have all the different languages. Yeah. Can I say this quickly? You said there were 19 different nationalities. So, the, I mean, this nationality meaning passport holder. Mm -hmm. You know, what passport they So, so they hadn't been to school, secondary school, or, or elementary school in Canada. They were no, they were they're international, international students. students. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you. Good point of clarification. Yeah, all international students. Um, so, these were the themes that the participants gave us. Now, uh, these are our terms as researchers for the themes. We took their words and coded them using uh, grounded theory practice, and these are our terms for the things that they said. So we're going to go through these, and I'll, I'll sample, give a sample of student, uh, participant response for each one. And if you're okay, I'd like to ask for volunteers for you to read. Uh, what the student said, it, would, it gives more of a student voice thing than me saying it. More authentic. So argumentation is the first thing they said. Could I have a volunteer to read Ashley, uh, Korean, L1 Korean? Okay, Ashley, fire away. If we argue, or if we write some essay, we write both negative and positive, both. We write both, 
but here I should write only one side, right? It is a big difference. If I write both sides and I get wrong, low mark here. <laughs> right? Here means the Canadian university context. And so in her perception was that when she writes an essay in Korean, uh, that both sides are presented. But here in Canada, her perception is low mark if I don't take a side. Ali, an Arabic speaker. But I have a volunteer. So in English, we use examples to support. Back home, when writing in Arabic, they only use examples. It's 30%. The other 70%, they use their ideas to support their ideas, like to explain them more. And so uh, Ali says that in, in Arabic writing that uh, you repeat ideas. You, you strengthen an argument by repeating it. And if you've ever lived in a Middle Eastern country and watched the discussions, that's what you, you, will, uh, you will understand. Uh, so, but Ali's experience was here you know, you, you make one point and then an example. Finished. Great. I have a question with the first one. <coughs> My perception is, it's the other way around. Normally when students come to us, they write one perspective because that's the, well, they just present the ideas. They're not encouraged to look at the balanced perspective. And this is what we teach them when they come to us at the university. So just sort of offense, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. That's hard. Yeah. But it says if you write both sides and they get wrong, low marks, is that a, a teaching practice where they come from? Uh, Why would they get? Wrong? Yes, and again, I should stress these are what students said. So I I hope that the EAP instructor isn't teaching that. The only way. <laughs> to present a, a written piece in English is to make one, only one clear uh, point. point. But this is what Ashley perceived. Whatever is being taught, <laughs> this is what she heard. Maybe they were preparing for IELTS. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. One, one, one more question. How yes. long were they in Canadian university or school before they did this paper? Yeah, it varies. It oh. varies. Okay. Depends on participants. Yeah, so after we're done, I can show you the whole table. Thank you. Good, good clarification. Could I have someone in the back row here? Could you be Kate? Um, <laughs> another example of that, when I talk about education, my thesis is that senior high school should not be extended, and students should uh, use the other years to get social experience. We talked about our news that one university student cannot do housework in China, but the teacher can um, believe it. Uh, this is another example that cultural factors can impose on writing. Right, so this student, I guess the, the topic was writing about the gap year, you know? Should we have a gap year and should, you know, something like that. And this student tried to say, a student cannot do housework in China. I think it's possible to do housework, but it could be that it's not, uh, according to this student, as common. So then this student's perception was the teacher didn't understand my example. So this is an example of how culture influenced my writing. Yeah, Ashley, you have a All right, this issue of voice. How about on this side at the back? Do we have a volunteer there to read uh, Juan's a Spanish speaker? So here, for example, I don't like to touch back things happen in my country or with another country. I think that create a political controversy and that there's a house to focus on topic of one, uh, one goal of difference. Okay. So often if, in a Canadian context, you know, we can we can talk about all kinds of hot political issues. So we legalized marijuana on October 17th in Canada. So that was a big essay topic in the EAP classes. 
Uh, but this, uh, this student feels like, you know, why are we stirring up political controversies? That's not, we're not helping anything. So uh, I don't like to talk about things that are divisive. All right, how about from this uh, second row at the back there, Claire? How well are racing speaking to extend with the right? The vote uh, which is right in China. So we just choose we just choose to the play that people always think or it's right. Even if we sometimes don't agree. In Chinese, you don't like your individual thoughts. You like the public opinion, something people will to the way that they so in in uh, in many countries, in many countries where uh, yes, <laughs> in countries uh, the, in a Middle Eastern context as well, many times you cannot express your opinion about the uh, the government. So uh, those students then come to Canada and they're asked to write something, you know, that uh, half of the class doesn't agree with. And so this, you know, she said, I, I learned to stand with the right, to say what everybody thinks. And it's very difficult to say things that uh, not everybody thinks. So this issue of voice. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So is it also related to the exam orientating the system in their country? In their country? Could be, yes. Could be. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, this role. Ashley. Okay, brainstorming, it is hard to do that. I had the time to do that before coming with ideas because I was used to find out the right answers. So we say to students, you know, process writing, mm -hmm. start by brainstorming uh, in an exam-oriented system. <laughs> you don't brainstorm. All right, uh, Grace. Maybe from that role, second role. Sure. I encourage critical thinking skills. Instructors promote students' working skills in Canada. On the other hand, in Canada, by allowing students to think critically, it increases the chances of developing skills that could help them in their writing. So this student was doing some reflection on the difference in uh, systems, I think. And, uh, so by the end, they thought, oh, maybe critical thinking, right? Maybe that's a good thing to do to get out right. Uh, I'll read Brooks. I'll take a turn here. Here's the thing that in Spanish we say things in a certain way, and in English you cannot say the same way sometimes, and sometimes I write something and the teacher will tell me, no, that's not how you write it because it doesn't make sense, so sometimes that happens. This cultural thought expression. Noor, uh, Arabic speaker, my culture affects my writing way. For example, when I use metaphors in my essays, I found that they are not strong because I just picked them from my culture and translated them. Uh, a cool expression a student taught me a, a while back in Arabic was, you know in English sometimes we say, they ate us out of house and home. The guests came and ate everything. In Arabic they say, uh, they ate the camel and all that it carried. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so this student used that in the in the writing and the teacher's tongue. <laughs> oh, now this is a good one. How about in uh, this this row here? Three of you, I guess. Alia, I think it's English writing is like a method. You need you need to do this and this and this to get this A plus. <laughs> Usually in Arabic writing, not like this. We didn't focus on how to write good Arabic, just writing. So I think that the EAP teachers were teaching genre. There's not just one way to express yourself, but whatever was being taught, 
what was being learned was English writing is a method. Do this and this and get A plus. Text structure. Just so here. In China, when you are writing, sometimes we do not need to write a topic sentence. And in English writing, the teacher tells us we should write a topic sentence in each paragraph. And when you begin a paragraph, when you write it in Chinese, you do not need to write the topic sentence at the beginning of the paragraph. Um, you can put it in the middle of the paragraph or at the last of the paragraph. Because I'm the senior high school teacher, so I have all come to my top sentence before paragraph. Whenever you were teaching Kate, <laughs> she wasn't getting it. <laughs> Alright, so comments so far. Questions, comments so far. I wonder if sounds familiar. No, no, it sounds familiar, but a little bit. I was just going to say about the previous one where the Arabic student says you just write in Arabic. Um, but that's their experience of the L1. They're not doing any analysis of the L1 because it's so natural. So maybe that's where a lot of this comes from. And they're thinking everything is rule based in English or, or whatever because they're being, they have to be taught it. Whereas. Um, yeah, maybe they're just not, even this Chinese student, maybe they know how to write and they're not analytically thinking about it in the same way as they do with the second language. Any other comments, questions, thus far? I wonder how much of this is actually cultural aspects as opposed to, you say, maybe the way that they are not taught to teach us in the world. What do you mean, culture? Um, like, for example, the student from Spain was mentioning about um, how they don't like to stir the pot and come up with controversial topics. I mean, in essays, maybe we do that, but in real life, people don't usually, they might be discussed certain things, but we usually aren't as controversial, maybe, and we're speaking compared to when we're writing an academic essay. So, I know so some of these points seem like maybe it's the way that they're being taught and they're saying the, the way that education affects. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And we wondered too, when you are uh, language learning, you would love the world to be neatly tied up. You would love your teacher to say, always write like this. But of course, it isn't like that in the real world. But we very much hang on to that. So we, we want the students to speak for themselves, but we must weigh, we must, as researchers, weigh, you know, what, what's being said, what is the context of what's being said. I think there's, I think there's culture in every slide, it's just presented to Because if you, if you think of writing as a cultural act, then, then it is. And, and writing isn't just a cultural act, it's a language act. And it depends how you experience writing. It depends on the language you're writing in, on the distance between written and spoken discourse. So I mean, one thing when you're thinking about Arabic people, and to a certain extent also Chinese people, is the distance in their own lives between what they speak and what they write. I mean, there's a funny example on social media in Hong Kong today of a mainland brokerage firm that's put out a, uh, a Christmas app, and if you read it in Cantonese, it says all your family are going to die for Christmas, <laughs> because they've used a particular idiom, <laughs> and it's printed in traditional character. And for, for most Arabic people, written, the written this written this book is already a second language, because people speak uh, Lebanese Arabic, or Yemeni Arabic, or Kyrene Fuj, or whatever. So, just as even when I was a kid in Germany, a lot of people didn't read High German until they got to first year of grammar school. 
and then all of a sudden the dialect had to go, and you have to get your tenses right, and your cases right, and so on and so forth. So I don't think you can get rid of culture in it. Sorry, that was a very long intervention, but I'm just thinking about your question about what the, you know, the learners would say. I'm, I'm speaking as a learner, I think, as a teacher. Mm, very good, very good points. I think it's also political. I mean, critical thinking is the backbone of a democracy. We're sort of ramming democracy down people's throats, and they probably don't come from a democracy. You know? I'm not saying ramming them, but all of a sudden they're free to speak. Or are they? Is there someone in the class that's watching? You know. Um, so I think that's maybe the elephant in the room that there is political. Mm -hmm. Any other comments thus far? Thank you. All right. Uh, text structure, I'll go pretty quickly here. Spanish, back home, longer sentences show one's intelligence <laughs> and competences. I found writing in English, it is more important to structure and be simple. Especially for the introduction and conclusion are completely different. Turkish speaker. The writing class in Turkey was not part of our culture when we were studying, but when I came here, I learned it was very important. First challenge was for me to write in my language, to learn because I didn't write in it before, and I learned writing first, and after that, at the same time, I learned writing in English. Wow. It was, uh, it was a double challenge for me. That's why, even right now, I struggle with writing. Then uh, this student, um, Spanish speaker, said, Colombian classes are generally teacher-centered. In Colombia, most classes are teacher-centered, which does not allow students to participate much and let them share ideas. And I like this, uh, I like this one. We, as a Latin American, yeah, South America, we write with more explanation and we like to I don't know the right word, but we like to decorate words. So we use a lot of adjectives and we try to explain more. So our style is more taken of the quantity instead of the quality sometimes. So I have learned here that it's more important to quality and of course to be concise and precise, not too much words, too much words. I'd like to read a decorated essay. Uh, Religion affects my writing, but I can avoid it now. For example, when I want to write about smoking or drugs, I want to write out prevention of smoking and drugs in Islam because I was accustomed to write like these reasons in my high school education. So then we asked to write on, do you agree with the legalization of marijuana? All right, some pedagogical implications. We felt that the findings had given us some important understandings for the classroom. The first was simply to recognize the cultural backdrops, and we have many in Canada, that L2 writers bring with them, and to see those as a resource, as teachers, not as a hindrance. Uh, perhaps we could ask students to bring an example lab report in their, in their uh, language and utilize this to highlight some of the features of lab reports written in English. We also felt that as instructors, we could be doing a much better job of scaffolding we realized from what the participants told us that we were much better at finding out what was wrong with their writing than we were at providing examples of what was right. Uh, providing examples of good writing and identifying the features of good writing uh, was something we felt as a group that we needed to be doing more of and uh, less of uh, finding what's wrong right off the bat. Uh, 
Uh, we felt that uh, some of the corpus tools, which are available at present, are underutilized in our context. We're perhaps using them as instructors, but not rarely bringing the students into them. Uh, plus, students expressed that they wanted feedback in class and feed, direct feedback as they worked on their writing. And our approach typically is to assign the writing as homework. Uh, give, it, give us the final piece and then we'll evaluate it. Then we'll give you feedback. And they really wanted to have feedback as they were working. So we felt that was a, an important consideration for us to look at. The issue of taking a position featured prominently in what uh, students told us. In some genres and academic writing, having a clear position is central to what constitutes effective writing, but not all. A difference between the upper bands of IELTS Task 2, for example, is whether a clear position is asserted throughout the writing. So this could be a washback, a test washback effect on students and instructors. But uh, some L2 writers told us that their culture, their perception of their culture, frowned upon taking a clear position. And so this remained a struggle for them in applying this clear position to an English writer. Uh, also, participants um, found it difficult to come up with ideas to generate topics. And in a Canadian context, this is often highly valued in EAP writing. Come up with your own research ideas. Uh, otherwise, it's plagiarism. And some L2 writers were shocked by that and uh, just really struggled with just sit there with a blank piece of paper uh, or presumably a blank screen on their mobile. Uh, unable to generate topics. And so part of what we took away as instructors is that, again, scaffolding, that we need to provide the means by which they can generate topics. For some L2 writers, this was a real struggle. So overall, I want to return to this idea of resource uh, our data indicated that we were not, as instructors, drawing as fully upon the resource that the students' uh, cultural and language background brought to the classroom. Because there were so many different languages represented, our tendency was to say, well, English can be the only sort of common uh, framework that we can bring to the class. I don't think instructors did that consciously, but maybe subconsciously. So uh, we really, I think, came away thinking we need to do a better job of using the linguistic resources as a resource and not as somehow a hindrance to their way. All right, questions or comments? And here's where we can really go off track. There is my uh, contact information. So uh, in the time remaining, you can feel free to uh, go anywhere with it. Can I ask you, um, they seem to be talking a lot about the writing that they're doing in the EAP class, but did, were you talking to them about the writing that they're doing in the, their main curriculum? And if, you know, were there any disciplinary differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there, there were some of those expressed, but I think that overall, we were, as researchers, a bit stunned that they were hearing whatever was being taught 
They were hearing method. It must look like this. So maybe that's what was being taught in the classroom. But whether it was or not, that's what was being heard. Even if it was a lab report or a, an abstract for an engineering paper or so. We wanted to ask a question mark. Yeah, my, my thoughts are sort of similar. I mean, the whole idea of giving examples of good writing mm. assumes that there is one form of good writing. Um, and, and I'd be surprised if, you know, like content actors, for example, were <coughs> sorry, content actors here, yeah. <laughs> sort of articulating what was good writing in their discipline. I mean, that they. Yeah, maybe we should say examples of writing rather than good writing. <laughs> Just writing, more examples of writing. <laughs> Adding a question here, I, I, it makes me think that we, we do make things too formulaic and, and too. I mean, these students are saying, you, you know, you're telling me if I do this, this, and this, I'll get an A. Or, or, or you know, references to the fact that they also. But there are conventions out there, and they know that they have to learn those conventions, so. But it's a, it's a delicate balancing act, I think, between giving them the resources that kind of idea of the hidden curriculum um, and then not be too prescriptive as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it's just also about the question about the writing. Because I'm always I'm also confused about it, how good it is. Uh, I once uh, to, uh, I once was a teacher in senior high schools, so I, I also provided some writing example to my students. But sometimes they they feel just discouraged. And also, uh, several days ago, I read some paper by Newman, and I wanted to <laughs> learn how to write uh, assignment, but I also feel discouraged because it's, uh, of course it's very good, but <laughs> it seems that I cannot achieve this so I feel disappointed, and I, I just I think maybe uh, it will um, make the student feel discouraged if we give them some examples. They cannot do that. That's a really good point. Good teacher. That's a real teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I've thought of it. Positive respo responses about cultural factors like from students. That's a really good question. No, <laughs> <laughs> not that I can think of. Students, that's a really good. Yeah, wow, that's a good question because I think most students saw it as a hindrance in what they express to us. That's a really good... When you uh, used a neutral word, affect your culture, how does your culture affect your writing? But we didn't say, um, does it, does it help your writing? writing or, yeah. Yeah. But wow. So no, I, I'm the, uh, thinking back, I can't think of a, uh, an example. Students tended to think of it as something they needed to get rid of or something. Wow. It was interesting that I mean, even the Spanish speakers, I, I would think that yeah, there might be bigger differences and therefore bigger hindrances for a Chinese speaker or an Arabic speaker, but even the Spanish speakers are saying what we're pointing out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and we have, we have many uh, Europeans um, who you, you know, the the similarity between the Latin roots, right, and English should should uh, make it easier, I guess. And uh, they say the same thing. So I'm going to take that back to our team and say, let's look again, and is, can we find anything 
that students treated it as a resource. We as we felt we need to treat it as a resource but for students. So, oh. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.